97 years, uh, one month and 13 days, people have tried to get historic preservation and to secure the site. And because of our Congressman Yoder, we're here today. I have other written testimony here, but I am unable to continue reading because I'm just so caught up in the moment and it is just... Uh, The Kansas State Supreme Court had given full carte blanche for the toxic waste dump to come forward at, at Quindaro, and I instantly uh, saw red. Like if you land down at the beach and you have your eyes closed and just pure red, and then it just turned into fire. And I made the statement that these people had just crossed over into hell. Look, um we, we um, shouldn't shy away from the S word, uh, slavery. It is a part of the history, albeit ugly, of our nation. This film has been so personal to me because um, the memory of my dad motivated me to make this film. I lost him just a few years ago. Appreciate all your concern and all the uh, things you do for us. Uh, you, you sure helped us all. And that message uh, that you heard, that's one of the last times I heard my dad speak. And, and I think about the impact that my dad had on me in regards to making the, the learning of history uh, such an impactful thing in my life. As he is a former history teacher. I don't know that we can keep expecting to have people, um, you know, fall on their sword for the Quindaro ruins. We can't be our own worst enemies. Um, off the record for a second. Property was a big deal. Once you've been property, to actually have property is a big deal. And we were only like third generation out of slavery, you know, in Quindaro. Quindaro is absolutely a beautiful place alongside the river, right across from Parkville, Missouri. Um, the slaves would come, most of the time walk across the ice. This is where my great-great-grandfather, Robert Monroe, buried the slave. He was the one that really is the reason why I'm here today. Brought my family over from uh, Platt, Clay County, Missouri, and uh, to freedom. If, even if you had papers that said you were a freedman, you could still be taken by snatchers, and that's what happened in Quindaro. Uh, during the, uh, the uh, day, you'd have snatchers from Missouri on the hill uh, above the community waiting for someone alone who was African American to walk in and be taken. And not only was it a felony to interfere with uh, someone taking a, a slave back, but if you didn't help them in taking a slave, uh, you also could be uh, charged with a felony. The Indians set up an area in the Old Quindale Cemetery called a signal tree. And they were able to alert the slaves as to where the bounty hunters were located. And they wouldn't move the slaves until the bounty hunters moved. 
you might have a material or, or something hanging on it. Or That tree dates back, it's real, real old. The first house that an escaped slave would come to was the Wyandotte House Hotel, which is my great-grandfather's establishment. He'd hide them in the basement and also the cistern. He would then, along with members of our tribe, uh, move them through the Indian trails up through our reservations in Ohio, Michigan, and finally to Toronto. This is the old Quindera Brewery. This dates back to 1850. This is the where well, they kept the wine and beer cold in the cellar. It stays cool there year round. This is where the slaves also hid. This was all one upstanding building. Uh, the community college come here and put up that structure to help stabilize it. This building is very old. You cannot, you see the mortar on the rock there. You can't find that at Home Depot or Lowe's. It, they use the sand in the river to help. But they were always afraid to come because they were told by their slave masters and other that we were savages and don't go over there because you will be killed, you're slaughtered, and all the negative um, things that would happen. Well, when they came across and we would greet them um, and they were afraid, we would tell them, you're people of the earth. And we would welcome them and they were one of the family. That's just, that's just who the Wyandotte were and, and the native culture in and of itself. And I don't know that there is such a thing. I, I, I mean, I know that in reading the stories that people, the old people who, who experienced that told, they said here the signal was to tie a cloth on a tree. They did not say quilt. Well, one of the things that everybody had to have was a bedroll. A bedroll is a quilt. It's rolled up and put on the back of your saddle. So that was a commodity. And I can't see people in this area selling, you know, using quilts that way. You use them, our family used them to keep warm. That's what we did. We made them. That's how I learned. You, you will do this because you will need this in the winter. You will be happy to have this in the winter. It's true. We get some cold winters here. One of the natives, brought a woman named Dorcas. She was the first black woman that was listed as being in the territory. And all of the Indians, other Indians, were up in arms about the prospect of having a slave among them. So they started helping people to cross the river and hide in the caves. There, was a, they, there were caves right along the river where people would hide until it was safe to come out. And the symbol for the safety was to tie a piece of cloth on the tree. Then they could go down the road called Happy Hollow and be free. Well, this whole block used to be full of business. This, right behind you was a business. Uh, right here we used to be at L.A. Furniture. There across the street was a subsidiary of L.A. Furniture. We had barber shops, had grocery stores, all kind of business up and down Quindaro. I believe that this neighborhood has uh, life-sustaining issues here. We have no grocery store in the first district, so no fresh fruits. That means there's a health issue here. Uh, our parks and recreation basically has been closed down for two years. They've taken the money and spent it elsewhere. It looks like a, a nuclear uh, bomb has gone off. You're not gonna get folks coming into the community to be educated about Quindaro unless you also lift up the community around there. So it's, it's a, a, a safe and um, um, healthy community too. The other big concern right now is um, that there's a lot of illegal dumping going on, not only at the ruins, but just in the area in general. So if you're thinking about the Quindaro ruins as a destination, uh, do you want to go to a destination where it appears 
that it's unkept, that it's not clean, that it's not safe. That's not where people want to go. So we have to be thinking out past the Quindaro ruins and what does the community look like as you enter the ruins. That's why I'm grateful for, for Gary being down there. It's the only place you can pretty much eat. I'm hoping that every one of these vacant build, buildings, I'm hoping that the people that own them or that's in position will take on a heart like me. You know, I had been a barber in my home for many years, and I had a challenge to find a building because people, they would just let it go down before they would sell. Well, you know, a whole lot of it happened like when the uh, crack cocaine air came in. You know, it uh, ran a lot of people out. If I'm the only business here, it's just like being uh, a watering hole in the middle of the desert, people are gonna come because you still have thousands of houses around you. There's not very many people left from the community. That's another thing that really messed up when they built 635 through here. And uh, you know, I don't know, I've heard different things, but I think they could have went in a different direction because uh, it t even took off Quindare Park. We used to play ba baseball up here all the time. And they even shaved off part of that. And uh, I don't know, it's because it was a black community, I kind of think they just said, we'll, we'll just go through there. I would just say it kind of isolated Quindare. My family was displaced by one of those highways, Highway 71 that runs through Kansas City, Missouri. You know, I remember when I was a young boy, you know, my mom telling me, oh, we used to live right about there, but you don't quite know it anymore because it's just highway land. I talked to a couple of people who were working with Mary Gardner and trying to make that revitalize. A lot of things they're trying to, people are talking now, even the swimming pool down here, they're talking about, you know, redoing some things and making things better in this area. I see the Quindaro Ruins potential as being something um, that could really provide uh, for a resurgent Wyandotte County, especially in an area that um, at least um, here uh, lately has been disinvested and disenfranchised when you look at uh, Wyandotte County uh, in general over the years. And even with the ruins, you know, it's all kind of politicians getting to make all kind of promises about what's going to happen, you're going to build new stores, going to get new buildings up here, redevelop housing and all that, and, and the Quindura ruins, you're going to put it back together and put, put money there, and it don't never seem to happen. Even when it, it looks gloomy, you know, we've, we, we're hopeful and, and, and we push it, try to make it better. I know myself, I don't care what the gloom look like, I'm always trying to push forward. I think the initial motivation for the film, you know, first stemmed from a personal relationship, a friendship that I have. Uh, and the two of us would often go to lunch and talk about social reform, issues of the day. This has a sort of, you know, slightly unkempt feel, to say the least. So uh, when, you know, uh, uh, the incident surrounding George Floyd happened, um, we took a, you know, a, a hard look at ourselves and, you know, and asked ourselves, how can we help? This is where it really happened. Down there is where um, you know, the slaves would come from Missouri over to the free state of Kansas um, and come up this hill. Uh, Quindaro was on this hill. I think the Underground Railroad is an important topic because it's centered around 19th century American history. <laughs> That history is still Im impacting us today. There is a literal and metaphorical s uh, space uh, that's, that's evolving. And again, that's impacting us today. So how could we impact that? It wasn't that the members didn't care. We had lots of support from the people in the pews, but it was the hierarchy, you know, the, you know, oh, there's something else when it comes to the bishops and their pastors. But I was incensed when I found out that the AME Church, I had grown up in the AME, I had baptized in the AME Church, I had gotten with the city of Kansas City, Kansas, 
and they had contracted with this second largest trash company in the world to put a landfill on the old town of Quindaro where I grew up. And they were getting money from uh, BFI. They'd been getting like $6,000 a month, I think, and uh, nobody even knew about it. And when we finally found out, you know, well, you know, we didn't want no landfill out here because, you know, we didn't want them big garbage trucks and stuff running up and down the streets. Now, I have not seen documents that, that showed where people signed their names on things. But, you know, the scuttle in the neighborhoods are like, yeah, those AMEs just wanted some money and somebody came along with a big check and said here, but they had to go through the city in order to get it, get the money. So that's what they did. In late 1982, the city sent letters to people in this area stating that there was a plan for a landfill here. You know, even though the, the excavations were not complete, they decided that they would proceed with the uh, landfill. They were approved a permit for a landfill, and we formed a, a group called the Concerned Citizens for Old Quindale, and we filed a lawsuit, and we made them do a, a historical study on the area, and we had some guys come in like on, from K-State and National Geographic, and they surveyed the area below this overlook and they found out that there was a town of Oakwindale which dated back to 1850 and they called it the Pompeii of Kansas. And hundreds of people started coming <laughs> and setting up tents over here and uh, camping out. And well, it leads us to say this was a volatile situation uh, and we, were to, we wanted it to be peaceful but we were prepared to sit down in front of bulldozers. And I said to city council, you know, you can do this if you want to. You can, he said, the only way that you're gonna do this is over my dead body. I meant that, over my dead body. And if you kill me, I'll come back and kick your ass. I said that, and I meant it. Most of the homes and buildings are gone because we were threatened by a landfill, a sanitary landfill by Brown and Ferris industry and they tore down a lot of the important places of the area, thinking they were going to get a, a landfill here. If they would have put that landfill down there, well, the water intakes for the, you know, for the city uh, were right down there, and, they, and people didn't want, to be, uh, want that water to be going in there drinking the water. And at the time, Johnson County District Number 1 was buying water from BPU. So like that area, was supplying water to the whole area at that time. And you get people who don't care about, I mean, tons of poison being dumped in, in one, oh, they were gonna put it in a plastic bag. That's what they said. Oh, we're gonna put it in a plastic bag. Yeah, but what, what are you putting in the plastic bag? Because they had all the approval from all the governmental entities to put the toxic waste on. They were even gonna take and put an uh, overpass, one over 635, so the trucks could come in and out because we were raising sand about the toxic waste coming right by the elementary school and right by uh, Northwest Middle School, Quinder Elementary, and then Northwest. It was 440 inbound, outbound trucks per day. Of course, the community rose up in anger and frustration and got the unified government to block the establishment of that landfill. Uh, and it gave renewed energy at that time. That's why the Overlook was built and some other things after the fact. None of that was there before this process occurred. Once you've been property, to actually have property is a big deal. And we were only like third generation out of slavery, you know, in Quindaro. So when you own property and you didn't, you wanted property to so-called be taken care of, you gave it to the church. That's how they got all that property.
Yeah, well, I was leaving office, you know, right as we were moving this bill through Congress, and we'd gotten very close to getting it passed, but we weren't quite there. And that is why I've introduced H.R. 5613, the Quindaro Townsite National Historic Landmark Act. And it really was a sort of one of those moments where you have, um, you know, Marvin, you know, from there in Kansas City, who has sort of lived and breathed this neighborhood, this community his whole life, in the halls of Congress talking about it to Democrats and Republicans on this committee. The chair now recognizes Mr. Marvin Robinson for his testimony. <laughs> wow. Uh... So I'm, I'm sitting up there, and, you know, I'm dressed to, you know, to, yeah. I'm in my father, I'm the funeral suit for my father. <laughs> this is indeed one of the most humbling moments in experiences of my entire life. Um, it's just overwhelming, actually. And I feel like I was, had been popped inside C-SPAN or CNN, and I started seeing people that had left. Uh, their images started coming into the room, and they, they, And I couldn't even... I have other written testimony here, but I am unable to continue reading because I'm just so caught up in the moment and it is just... Uh... I say, do whatever you all need to. I'm, a, I'm unable to uh, finish and complete. So whatever you want to do, because I don't want to cry. Uh, Uh, Mr. Robinson, you might tell the committee, uh, what's the community like today? Then the, co the Congress people started bouncing back and forth with communication, and then Kevin Yoder, you know, I, I was able to recompose myself, and, but they, they came. Uh, but we weren't able to get the bill completely passed uh, at the end of that year, but it was teed up to go, and so, of course, we supported um, my successor, Representative Davids, and her team to uh, carry the baton forward. I took a lot of the, the work that um, he had been doing and that had been going on for a long time and we just kind of, you know, it's almost like a relay uh, race and, you know, we were that last leg. For what purpose is it, does the gentlewoman from Kansas seek recognition? If you watch the House floor on C-SPAN, you can see, uh, you know, where the speaker sits and the clerks, and um, you, I didn't know this until I got there. I walked down and I actually handed a clerk the, the bill. Quindaro is an important part of United States and Kansas history. Sharice Davids immediately jumped on board, even though she was from the opposite party. She defeated Yoder. She supported this legislation. And that led Senator Roberts to work as the Senate was considering helping bundle together a variety of actions. I'd also like to thank Senator Pat Roberts for his leadership on this important issue. It took absolutely no convincing um, for Senator Roberts to become involved uh, because once he understood that um, you know, it did have the history that it had. He was completely on board. This task, uh, you would think it'd be a difficult one. Actually, it went just very smoothly. And that's because of you. You know, from Condero to Congress, this message is getting around the nation so we can see our work. And it's just one of those rewarding feelings that what we're doing actually is Echoing through the echoing through the halls of Congress. It's just like an amazing thing to get the chance to be a part of um, a small part of something that's been going on for so long. While they are screaming about impeachment and how much money goes to a wall and all this stuff that was up here, here this work and discussion was going on underneath, but with staffs from these various elected office holders uh, working with the committees and everything all to, can we slide this in to this larger bill? And guess what? They did.
Okay, so here we are at the Quindaro site. And then as we walk over here to, the, to my right, we can see uh, the main entrance, I guess you would call, um, to the site. And what you have here is a locked gate. Um, this has been locked every time that we've been here. Uh, this overlook itself has been used for, for community gatherings. Um, and this looks like this area is just used for people who come here maybe in the evenings and just leave their trash, unfortunately. So being British, I'm no expert on bullet holes, but uh, these, that's what these look like to me. And generally speaking, you know, this is starting to flake off. Um, and it just has a sort of, again, there's trash on the ground. And this is new since I was last here. There's more graffiti on the ground here. We were just here last week and didn't see this. And you can see that there's still trash littering around here. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a shame to me. I mean, this is really the main part of the Quindaro site. And it's clearly, you know, not really being used except for this type of activity. I was just up here in the overlook and I'm heading towards the, the stairs that have obviously been put here uh, with a view to leading people down into the, into the ruins themselves and the, and the site of Old Town um, Quindaro. But as soon as you get to the bottom here, <laughs> you can already see that there's huge grasses growing in here and th this area has really not been uh, obviously cleared. We've just got, <laughs> it's being reclaimed by, uh, uh, by vegetation. And um, as you can see, we're coming down to a, a little bit of shingle here. Um, but again, this is, this is very minimal and certainly not maintained. And all the, the rich history that happened in this area is just, it's not buried under trash, but it's buried under, just you know it's just buried it's just being reclaimed there's nothing here that would tell you this was you know sacred ground and important in the history of this country okay so we're just going to walk back up the hill and as we leave the, what looks like the river floodplain here we're heading back up under the railroad back up towards the Quindaro outlook and you can just see that the uh, the bridge here is <laughs> like a lot of the site to be honest is falling into some disrepair maybe when you come through you can look the reinforcements coming through bits of concrete have dropped yeah it doesn't look in very good shape at all <laughs> Just a couple of weeks ago, the uh, unified government and the um, uh, Western University Association uh, entered into a memorandum of understanding. The way the MOU is written, there's no monetary transaction. There's no monetary conveyance. It is conveyance of the land. And if the two organizations cannot work together, the land will, will not be conveyed. I mean, it's a non-binding MOU. There's tons of money available for the site. The city won't even make application for the money because they're saying they need 25 to 30 more years. This project is probably going to outlive the three of us. This project is probably a hundred million dollar project over 20 years, if not longer. Gordon Criswell told us that on May the 8th, he said that the city said it would take 25 to 30 years for them. Nobody never did no pro professional planning. Now they have professional people coming. Well, I think we get there by, by one, trying to figure out where do we find some dollars to engage a consultant to come in and work with the community. It really ought to be called a founding board. Right. Uh, so it's made up of seven people, uh, four people, uh, that represent the AME Church and Western University and three people that represent the unified government. That church uh, is responsible for overseeing through the association like, about 85 percent of the land that falls within the boundaries of the National Commemorative Site and the National Register of Historic Properties. 
The other 15% in there are owned by different naming entities associated with the unified government. The unified government does not own the most sacred part of, of that land. Um, that's the AME Church. But the unified government is the entity that is best situated to bring funds to the project. Can't say owned and managed by the church. The church isn't effectively doing any clearing or any management of all that. That's very expensive and it does not have the funds. That's why there's an effort to create an entity to try to raise money to do that kind of clearing because the church in and of itself will never be able to do that uh, in all likelihood. Uh, uh, unless someone by the name of, of Gates or Buffett were to join the church. Mahomes. Uh, Mahomes might, yes, definitely Mahomes. has the power of making something arbitrarily uh, uh, an NHL, National Historic Landmark. However, the National Park Service doesn't want you to do that. We learned early on that the Park Service doesn't really like Congress to designate National Historic Landmarks. They want to do that process and they don't want politicians doing that. But there's a little bit of a chicken and egg. We need to show some local investment. We need to show community involvement. We need to build up the prominence of the site to get it to a spot where it could be a National Historic Landmark. The spending on the project has not been transparent. Uh, and you know, when you don't have a transparent um, process, uh, and you don't um, put a value on transparency, it's hard to get people to sign up for more. Over the years, there's been hundreds of thousands of dollars thrown at the Quindaro ruins. And when you look at the ruins present day, you do have to ask the question, where did the money go? We did not capitalize on the national commemorative designation. We didn't use that as a springboard uh, to move the project forward. It, it certainly doesn't look like a whole lot of work has been done and it doesn't look like a lot is being done right now. We can talk a lot about um, infighting and uh, fighting across the aisle on a lot of topics. I don't think we can do that with this topic because um, the political will was there, the interest was there, and you know, I don't know that we didn't miss our golden opportunity. So what was that, what was that money that was is that coming from federal sources or state? Yeah, from federal sources. Really? Yeah. So, so what's the status of that? I had heard, I had heard it was like about $5 million, you know. That would, that would have gotten a lot of stuff started, you know. It was never really on the table. It was uh, something that could be, um, that could be a possibility. I don't know that we can keep expecting to have people um, you know, fall on their sword for the Quindaro ruins. It's it's just sorry. Sorry. We can't be our own worst enemies. Um, a 
off the record for a second. Because ultimately, what a site like Quindaro wants to do is be seated at the table with all of the other co cultural organizations in the community, right? I mean, there's a, there's a cultural banquet going on and we're, we're all there contributing what we can and participating in the uh, dinner conversation, as it were. And so for us at the museum, we really represent the Kansas City uh, lens on that American story narrative. Not only just the history, but the sound itself. So our museum really is just a, a, a beautiful demonstration of the art form. Along with our neighbors, the Negro League Baseball Museum, we really kind of represent a golden standard of what it is to be a part of the black community and tell the black story uh, of this community and the people that have really put in the work and sweat to make it what it is. This is the site of the Battle of Osawatomie. It occurred here on this very site in, in, uh, the, uh, in August, on August 30th, 1856. And this uh, battlefield has been preserved to uh, preserve the memory and the events here that occurred here in not only Osawatomie, but in the area that shaped American history. I think we're a tremendous resource for the community of independence itself. And we are a kind of literal bookend to the historic district of independence. Yeah, we're situated right now in the middle of a suburban neighborhood, a very normal looking neighborhood in terms of lots of trees, houses next to each other and the like. This particular rescue done by John Brown that I'm speaking of is one of the most well-documented underground railroad elements ever and because of that the National Park Service added this site to the Network to Freedom. We are a public-private partnership so the government owns and operates this facility but any of the big upgrades that you see any of the things like the exhibit and a lot of the programming and the sort of interpretive elements in that way that get baked into our to our visitor experience that is raised primarily, there, there, are, there is some government support for that, but primarily that's private dollars that are raised. Uh, we are a partnership site. This is actually, uh, if you look on the map, it is uh, uh, John Brown State Park. I mean, it's owned by the state. There's a 99-year lease on it with the city, and they mow it and take care of it. And the cabin is the same thing. It's a state historic site. but. I'm a city employee, so, uh, and we know the city pays for electricity and things like that. Lawrence has repeatedly looked at preservation of historic structures and finding adaptive reuse in some occasions of those historic structures. But like I said, this is a very stereotypical suburban neighborhood. It would not want a uh, weed growing dilapidated falling down building in the middle of this neighborhood. When people come to Kansas City, what do we tell them we want them to go to? We want to go to the World War I Museum, right? You want to go to Union Station, you want to have some Kansas City barbecue, and oh, we have this uh, historic landmark that is part of the, you know, the, the, the Trails to Freedom, part of the Underground Railroad, and some really amazing things happen here. If I were newly hired to run that site, the first thing I would do is visit all of the other sites in, in Kansas City and, and, and talk to not just the directors of those sites but the curators and especially to the educators, the interpretive specialists that are in each of those sites and try and learn and find out how do they tell their stories. If I were to put myself in their shoes, uh, the first thing I would do is I would build up grassroots support um, in the area, I'd build local pride in it. And so for folks who are, who are building upon these sites and building upon those rich traditions and history, uh, it's important to lean into community. It's, you know, it's from community that it, it launched, but it will be with community that it continues forward. If I had my way, I'd like to see a Smithsonian-style um, museum. There's historic value, 
But then uh, just from um, when you look at Wyandotte County and that area, I see it being a, an economic catalyst as well to bring about the types of developments um, that that disenfranchised area of our community not only wants, but they deserve and need. The fact is money that is invested in a cultural organization circulates through the community seven or eight times. When people come, for example, to the Truman Library, well, they're probably going to have lunch in one of the restaurants here up on the square in Independence. They're probably going to do some shopping in one of the shops up around the square. Uh, they might spend, you know, the hotel nights in Independence might benefit from the fact that somebody's here. And oh, if they find out, by the way, oh, the trails and the church history stuff and the arts district, that's all here too, they might stay another night. They might have breakfast and then lunch and then dinner. So all of a sudden, the restaurants, the shops, the every other business benefits. Uh, people have been coming to see the cabin literally since 1857. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's no joke. Uh, so we have, it's very important to us. It is one of, it is uh, one of, if not the main industry that we have here in town. It's important that, to take the breadth of what we've got here in the region, to really see it all and take in all of, all of the importance of the history behind it. And it's not always in, within museum walls, although I adore museums because I help run one. But certainly sometimes we, we talk about getting outdoors, we talk about getting outside of institutions and really understanding the importance that they contribute to history as well. And importantly with Freedom Trail, or even our broader investments with the Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area in, in Western Missouri and Eastern Kansas. This idea of saying that kids now can walk those steps and perhaps kind of see something about it. it. It will never be exactly the same, but perhaps if you're walking through a cold day in January or a hot day in July, you see just a bit, experience just a bit of what someone else went through. This region is made up of some very strong communities, each with very impressive and important cultural sites that add up to um, not just a tourist opportunity, but I think a profound understanding of what went on here and why that matters. Even though they're ruins, you know, something in that land, it, it retains it, right? It retains that, um, not only spiritual quality, but it retains the memory of, of purpose and of promise. There's something spiritual here. There's something powerful that rises up from where this space is, from where, what these people have created. But I really, really hope that um, places like Quindaro and other places around the country are, are able to help elevate and, um, and, and share that history that Native people had here. And, um, and then, you know, particularly uh, when, when there were so many tribes and so few tribes are known of uh, in the more mainstream discourse. I think, it's, I think it can be really, really powerful. Our kids and grandkids are going to write the next chapters in the books of racial equality and what better way for them to do it than to understand um, the sacrifices and the struggles that were given to get us to a point of where we are today and to understand those burdens and to understand that they now carry that torch forward. The heroes of the war and the struggle aren't just generals, aren't just colonels, but they're also these types of folks who are working to develop pathways, these types of folks that built whole communities and networks for freedom. It shouldn't be something on the end of a road as it exists now, on the end of a road where somebody says, oh, there happens to be a place here. It instead needs to be the sort of thing where people are saying, this is part of our culture every day. There, there really is room at the table for everyone, and we would love to see um, additional sites and additional facilities come online and be a part of this rich cultural heritage that this region has to offer. Thank you.
somebody might slip and tell you something. And because you ask questions of anybody and everybody, you might be able to put a picture together. In the African-American tradition, New Year's Eve, often um, black-eyed peas are a culinary staple. And I was actually there in early January last year and saw that some folks had left black-eyed peas and some other kind of African-American culinary traditions. January 1, I usually try to get the bag of the black-eyed peas. I want whoever is dropping those off to be able to share the story that they know about Quindaro, the story that they know about Kansas City. I want every school kid to be able to see it and be able to experience it. Sometimes we've had people, maybe 20 or 30, depending on what the weather's like, but most years there's nobody. Another big event that happened, you know, as we were getting this film going is we adopted our son. And, and he's made me look harder um, at issues of social reform. Dump truck's still there, uh, truck! <laughs> There are a lot of things that I want for my son, but one of the things right near the top is I really hope he keeps his heart open to places like Quindaro. For us to be able to stand here in this place and feel the sp their spirit saying to us, keep going, keep going, keep going till God says done. Our ancestors came right on up the river and kept going and kept going. Rain, snow, sleet, or whatever. And we must stand on that and keep them. At some point, it's our land. It's the land of certainly my ancestors. Am I hopeful ab about the ruins? Uh, I don't know. I, th I think there's a huge uphill climb. I just don't know if these two separate entities can work together to get the Quindaro ruins where they need to be. It, it's something they've tried for a long time. And at what point does somebody say, this, this just isn't plausible? I, I, I know they're not there yet. Through many. And he made the site in honor of his daughter, Quindaro which in the French Canadian one, that language means bundle of sticks. I'm a Democrat, but I vote issue. And for years when I came back home, I, I was a non-affiliate. And in order to go to some of the little circles the, the, uh, that my mother's in, I had to go back, flip to the Democrat party. But I am loyal to my issue. The history is here and I tell people often that when Dr. King gave his great speech about having had a dream, it had actually manifested right here in the centermost part of the country at the edge of the Missouri River. This is uh, the uh, Frederick Douglass Underground Road 2022 Legacy Award. It was an email and I just broke down and cried. Literally, I was like, wow. <laughs> Somebody here appreciate us. You know, you know. Uh, thus far and grace. Well, my vision, and it's just one one vision, is that where the old Douglas Hospital and um, uh, the old nursing home facility was located, that concrete um, foundation that you see just behind the John Brown Center. Uh, statue that would be a visitor center so that people could pull in, go inside, and experience the stories associated with Condero. They could then walk out to a renovated um, overlook. We continue to make errors as a society re related to systemic racism. We don't address those things unless we understand 
how we got to where we are. So I'm a big believer in telling all our history, particularly the uncomfortable parts, because it's those uncomfortable parts that actually give me hope for the future, that we survive the bad things and are moving toward a more just society down the road. Just have a moment of silence, uh, if we can. <laughs> 